You may be seated as we pray together. Um, it's good to see you all again. Uh, for those of you that have forgotten who I am, my name is Jordan. I'm one of the ministers here. And I look forward to catching up with you after uh, the service a bit, uh, hearing how the last month has been. Let's pray together. Father, may the words of my mouth the meditations of our many hearts be pleasing, acceptable, honoring in your sight, O Lord, our Maker and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, after a majestic hymn of praise, woven through from beginning to end of the marvelous story of what God has done in Christ, Paul now turns in chapter 1 of the letter to the Ephesians to prayer. First, praise for what God has done, and then prayer that God's people would come to a deeper understanding and experience of what he has done and the power of God at work in their lives. And it's important to remember that Paul prays from prison, where he experienced not serenity, but searing hardship, not tranquility, but brokenness and anxiety. And yet his prayer is buoyant. It's exuberant. It's almost triumphant. It is filled with the joy of the Lord. It's almost like Paul is a racehorse surging out of the gate at the beginning of the race. He gathers so much momentum so quickly and so confidently. He speaks on the grandest scale of Jesus Christ's resurrection and enthronement in heaven and his reign over all the entire earth. Though Paul is confined to a jail cell, his vision is vast. And Paul wants us to share that vision too. So he prays in verse 18 for spiritual illumination that the eyes of our hearts would be opened. And he prays in verse 17 that this would happen as God gives us the spirit, the Holy Spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And this little Greek word behind revelation is apocalypsis, from which we get the word apocalypse. Think the last book of the Bible. It means literally to open a door or pull back a veil so that you can see something that was previously unseen. So Paul is asking that the veil would be pulled back in our lives, and that we would see something. So what is it that Paul wants us to see? What does he pray that we may know? Three things, verse 18, that you may know first, what is the hope to which he has called you? Second, what is the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And third, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? So the hope of God's calling, the riches of God's inheritance, and the greatness of God's power. Let's take each of these in turn and see if we can catch a glimpse of what Paul sees. So the hope of God's calling. It's amazing how quickly human hopes rise and fall. It was not many years ago when there was a certain fervor in the air among certain communities that I knew. They felt to some extent like society was turning a corner. Dare to Hope was the political slogan. Um, the Audacity to Hope was the book that came out. And even N.T. Wright, our own evangelical scholar, added Surprised by Hope. And all this sense of exuding confidence for the days ahead. I think if I were to pick a title that experienced, described the experience of the last 18 months for a lot of people, it would probably be like dashed, uh, your hopes are dashed or something like that. <laughs> the dashing of hopes. Um, whether that's hopes and friendships or religious communities or political uh, and medical processes or hope in stable jobs and economies, I mean, you name it, whatever it is, I think there is a certain widespread cultural, social, corporate loss of hope in one another, in our institutions, and in our future. And many people are, are wrestling with this sense of disillusionment, like, what do I do with this? What is life really about? Is there anything solid in this world? What am I actually striving for? And who and what can I actually depend on? Paul's prayer could not be timelier. He prays that the Spirit of God would stir in the hearts of the people of God that they would recover the hope to which they have been called. 
And notice here that the hope is grounded in God's calling upon our lives. So it's not grounded in some emotional state within ourselves, like how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about others, or how we feel about the particular cultural moment that we find ourselves in. Whenever hope is rooted in any of these things, it's like mist in the wind or fog on a hot summer day. It goes as quickly as as it comes. Paul says that hope is grounded in God's call. And Paul says that God's call is the extension in time of his eternal loving purpose of election and predestination before the foundation of time. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And just a verse later, in love he predestined us for adoption through him. Romans 8, verse 30, those whom God predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. And so Paul has this sense that our calling to belong to the Lord Jesus, to follow him, to become like him, to have every aspect of heart, mind, will, transformed by the goodness of his glory and grace is the temporal extension in time of God's eternal will for us. And therefore, if it was something that was God's will for us before the foundation of the world, it means there is nothing in the world that can threaten it. There's nothing more solid than this will of God amidst all the changes and chances of this life. There's nothing that holds more true amidst no matter what our status or our station or our situation. And I think this is important because I know that there are some of you gathered here, some who are gathering in their family rooms right now, who are going through some pretty difficult stuff at this moment. And Paul is praying that you would be reminded of God's calling upon your life and that that would give birth to a fresh sense of hope. Now, the question that naturally arises is like, well, what is that hope? And that leads us to the next two points in Paul's things. But, I mean, Paul could have reached for a number of images throughout Scripture to describe what our hope is, right? He could have said, like, the comfort that God promises you in affliction, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, or the inseparable love that you would experience in the midst of suffering, uh, Romans 8. Or the future glory that will outweigh, far outweigh, the present suffering that you're experiencing. Romans 8 again. Or the fact that God is going to complete the good work that he's begun in you. Philippians chapter 1. That we'll see God face to face. Revelation chapter 21. That there will be no more sin and shame and death and injustice. Revelation chapter 21. And that the new creation will be full of peace and righteousness and joy. 2 Peter chapter 3. And that we will finally become the whole flourishing human beings that God always intended for us to be, 1 John chapter 3. Paul could have pulled any of these, but there's two in particular that he grasps for. The first is the riches of God's inheritance, verse 18. He prays that we would know what are the riches of God's glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, there's two possible ways of interpreting in the Greek this word inheritance. It could be God's inheritance that he gives to the saints. Or it could be that the saints themselves are God's inheritance as king. So, in other words, it could be an eschatological something. The inheritance is something that God gives to the saints in the new creation. Or it could be ecclesiological. The saints themselves are God's inheritance now. I kind of tend to favor the latter a little bit, but whatever way you look at it, the main point is that Paul is praying that the Spirit would discern, would stir in us uh, the capacity to discern and cherish at the core of our being the immense privilege it is to be a member of God's church. Paul layers on the images throughout the rest of Ephesians, and we're going to discover them. The church is the foretaste of God's new creation. The church is his treasured possession. The church is his beautiful bride. The church is his own body. The church is his holy temple. And Paul is wanting us to see just what a privilege it is to be a part of the riches of God's inheritance. 
And I think this is pastorally important for us in a couple of different situations. First is that if you find yourself at odds with the surrounding culture because you are a Christian or because you belong to the church, remember Paul is writing from prison. He's at odds with the surrounding culture for what he's doing. And the second situation is if you are feeling unimpressed, hurt, or disillusioned by what you see or have experienced in the church. In both cases, whether it's cultural pressure or internal disillusionment, the temptation is to withdraw from the people of God. And I've talked with a number of people who have been struggling with this lately. I had a conversation most recently with a childhood friend about a week ago, and he told me that he and his family are no longer going to church. We grew up in high school youth group together. What was the final nail in the coffin for him? Well, there's a long story there. It's a complex story, but he just said to me, it was seeing the way significant portions of the church have responded over the last 18 months to COVID and to the racialized dynamics of American society. And he was disillusioned, and he said, I can't be a part of this community anymore. Now, there's complex reasons behind his story, as there is for every one of us. And every one of us has had painful stories and experiences of different shapes and sizes. Every one of us could bring our list and come up here and lament and grumble about the things we've experienced in the community of God. No one's unique in that way, because there's simply no church that's perfect this side of heaven. But that does not change the fact that God loves and delights in his church as his treasured possession. That is the gospel. That his grace covers sins. That he forgives. That he pours out his blessings upon those who rebel against him. It is his body. It is his bride. It is his treasured possession. And so Paul prays for us that the Spirit of God would soften our hearts to be able to see what God sees and to be able to treasure what God treasures and to consider it a privilege for ourselves to be among the broken yet in the process of being redeemed people of God. And we need the Holy Spirit for this. This has to be a gift from God. And it's only in that way that we can join the psalmist in saying, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord, of hosts. And the second hope that Paul wants us to see is the greatness of God's power. And this is where Paul spends most of his time in this prayer. It's like he gets to this point, and then he's just soaring, and there's no turning back. It's kind of like the person that's sitting at the dinner table, and they volunteer to pray, and then they take way too long to pray. And everybody's like, we're kind of hungry. Can you get this done with? And they're just all excited about what they're praying about. I kind of imagine Paul a little bit that way. He wants us to know, verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe. And Paul here is grasping for every word that he can find in the Greek language and layering one upon the other to try to impress this upon our imaginations. There's four different Greek words. One is dunamis, the ability to accomplish something. One is energeia, the internal energy to accomplish that thing. One is kratos, which is the power to overcome anything that stands in the way from you accomplishing that thing. And the other is iskus, the actual act of accomplishing that thing with your internal resources and power and authority. All of this, says Paul, is not just some abstract pie in the sky. All of this is for the good of us who believe. At the core of the gospel, according to St. Paul, is the power of God unleashed in the lives of those who trust that this humble and bloodied and crucified man from Nazareth is now risen Lord and sits enthroned upon the whole entire the universe. And the core conviction of Paul's prayer is this, that there is no one in the universe, invisible or visible, that has any power or authority over this Jesus. There is no one in the universe, no organization or institution or corporation or ideology or political movement that has any power or authority over this Jesus. The king is on the throne. That throne is never going to be abdicated. It's never going to be usurped. And it's never, ever going to be dethroned. Psalm 46 says, though the earth gives way, 
Though the mountains be moved into the sea, though the chaos swirls around us, we can still be still and know that he is God. Psalm 2 says, why do the nations rage in vain? Why do the peoples plot? Why do the kings of the earth set themselves against the Lord and his anointed? And God says, I have set my king on my holy hill. I will make the nations his inheritance. Psalm 99, the Lord reigns, let the earth tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul. Let all that is within me bless my holy name. Why? Because the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. I unplugged while I was on vacation. Three weeks of no email, no computer 95% of the time, and I put my phone on airplane mode. So I was pretty ignorant of everything that was going on in the world. Until the last couple of days, I've kind of been checking in again, and I go, wow, a lot can happen in a few weeks. <laughs> I mean, just, just one brief glance, and, and it's like the Delta variant is a thing. It's running rampant, and the fourth wave of COVID, and it's skyrocketing, and the Taliban is effectively retaking over Afghanistan, rendering some two decades of US involvement almost somewhat fruitless. And Haiti has been hit with yet another massive and devastating earthquake. And I mean, we could go on. And it's it's not that this is like a uniquely difficult moment in history compared to ones in the past. I think it's more that our internet access allows us to understand what's going on in every place in the world in real time. So we can see it all and we can feel it all and we can be overwhelmed by it all in a way that previous generations simply couldn't. And it's in this context that I think it can be really hard for us to settle into that truth that Jesus Christ does in fact reign in every place, in every sphere, and in every time. That he reigns over the principalities and the powers and over the rulers and authorities. That he reigns over kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers. That he reigns over institutions and corporations and families and individuals. That he reigns in the invisible realm and in the visible realm, in this age and in the age to come. That he reigns right here in North America and in Haiti and in Afghanistan and in every other place in all of God's vast creation. All things, says Paul, literally all things are put under his feet. He is head over all things, verse 20. Paul knows that when we look at the world around us, it's going to be hard for us to believe and feel this sometimes, to experience it in the core of our being. I mean, Paul's writing from prison. (laughs) He knows what it's like to not be in control of your life and to be in chains at the hand of another. Yet he prays, not just for himself, but for others, that the Holy Spirit would come and open the eyes of our hearts to lift the veil that we would be able to see what we cannot see with the naked eye. And what is most true about the world in which we live in, it's that Jesus is enthroned. It is this, says Paul, and this alone that is the hope of the church. It is this, says Paul, and this alone that is the hope of the nations. It is this, says Paul, and this alone that is the hope of all creation. And so Paul prays, may the Spirit open your eyes to see it. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let all that is within me bless his holy name. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His kingdom rules over all. Brothers and sisters, it's good to be back with you. I preach these things to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.